มิสเตอร์คิดนั่นค่ะฟองแต่เองค่ะนี่ก็เชลลีเดอร์ฟองไอเดียค่ะ Hello good morning everybody Thank you thank you for uh, having me here just uh, it's okay if I stand by here Okay um, My name is k i t a n Chuck and I work for IBM as the technical leaders for uh, APEC and my coverage is across IBM software so I spend a lot of time reading because there's so much stuff today you know in technologies I look at the data AI I also look at the automation security as well as sustainability portfolio so uh, but my deep down where I came from Uh, is data and AI. I've been in the data and AI side of the business for the last 23 years. Uh, so, very happy to be here. I uh, I wasn't sure exactly what to prepare, given the diverse background of the group. I understand you guys are coming in, in from various part of the SCBX business. Uh, some are in data X, some are in tech X, some are in. Uh, Robinhood, I believe there are there are a number of different units. I think there is uh, so very much uh, looking forward to having some good discussion. Now I'm going to start with an example of something that we have done with the Masters Golf Tournament. Um, I know golf is quite popular in Thailand. Any golfer in the room? No golfer at all. Oh shoot! Uh, maybe I should. Have. Maybe I should have selected the, the, the tennis, the U.S. tennis open one. But reason why um, I've selected this as an example to start our morning is that we've had a long-running partnership, IBM, with the Masters Golf Tournament over 10 years, and each year um, we try to work with our partners, and in this case, the, the tournament uh, organizer, to create a more compelling experience. For the people who are attending or watching the golf tournament, the golf tournament. This the, the latest uh, edition just happened back in April, so less than uh, less than two months ago, a month about a month and a half ago, where the tournament took place. Now, uh, this time, the things that we've gone and done, uh, as you can see there, is that we brought along generative AI into the solution. So there were. Two things that's being done in this that's interesting: uh, generative AI for commentary, and then a whole by whole uh, player performance prediction was incorporated into the website and into the application that the, the people would use. Now, if you're a sports fan, you know it's interesting to hear what the comment the commentator would say during the the play, right? When you're watching football, so there's usually an expert. That's describing to you what's happening. Now, in most tournaments, there's one live stream. The TV streams is the one that gets the expert talking about the players, talking about all the stats. It's great, but if you want, or if your favorite golfer happens not to be the number one, two, or three golfer, and you want to watch how they're doing, all you get is just streaming videos and not much more. Now. Previous years, so in 2022, we provided viewers with the predicted stats, how well that uh, golfer is going to do in that hole. But this year, we use uh, a, a generative AI, so similar to ChatGPT, but not ChatGPT. This one only knows how to speak golf. It knows all the golf terms. It knows how to talk like a commentator, and started actually. Adding commentary to every one of those video clips, so there are 90 players playing in the tournament. Over 20,000 clips of videos were so basically 20,000 holes that were being played. So all these has to be an, uh, commentary annotated, all done by an AI, all done with only 30 seconds delay. So the video comes in within 30 seconds. It's enriched. With a human-like commentator talking about what's going on, and then on the side, the prediction of how well this golfer is going to do in this hole. Now, why is this interesting? Well, there's like several reasons why I think it's interesting. One is the partnership. 
and IBM liked to form long-running partnership, but over time, it also evolved the technology. But the most important part, I think, is that we're using the latest AI technology to engage the customer. We're trying to bring them in so that they have a stronger emotional attachment to the master's terms. And that's how you retain a customer, right? You build that relationship. So two separate, the, the other aspect that's interesting is that there's two aspects of AI that's being used in this solution, which is why I think from a technical discussion perspective, it's also very interesting. We didn't just use a single type of AI, right? We used at least two different types, if not more. But um, one was, of course, the generative AI the commentary. Now, I, I'm sure we've all tried ChatGPT here, right? You don't have to show a hand, but I'm sure we all tried it, because I just tried it the other day. I asked it to write me a, a, a bio introduction for me. Um, it didn't go so well. Apparently, there's someone much more famous than me out there with my same name. I thought, you know, write me a bio, write me an introduction to, to Kitten and Chum. So, and I started reading it, and it was actually quite interesting. It started off by saying, Kitten is a very sharp dresser. Influential in, in, in fashion. I'm like, oh, that sounds good. And I looked at myself and I thought, no, that's probably not me. It turns out, in Hong Kong, there's someone by the same name who's a fashion designer. Her name's Bonita Chan. But anyway, um, so the generative AI aspect is similar to ChatGPT, but not bad technology, but IBM technology. And it's generating that text. So that's one mode of engagement. But the second aspect that's equally interesting is more traditional machine learning. Working with numbers, predicting the whole by whole player scores. Because that's equally interesting because as a business, you have two aspects to things. One is you want to predict, for example, the lifetime value of your customer or the most likely uh, rates or uh, that will be accepted by that customer. That prediction is classic machine learning. You guys know this already because you guys do this every day. But you can blend the two things together to improve engagement and improve business. You can, in the same app, use two things, two modes of engaging the client, sharing some very accurate prediction as well as some very interesting commentary that are maybe a bit more subjective can, can build that engagement. So, interestingly, if you have really good data and you take into account things like weather, wind condition, uh, other data during the week, you can get very accurate with, or even with golf playing. Um, I believe the stats we have last year is that the master's team that's working on this uh, was able to get 70% accurate prediction uh, within a, a small margin of errors in terms of the performance of the, of the, uh, of the, of the player. Uh, but the one really interesting part, and after this I'll jump into a different example. One really interesting bit that happened also is that the statistical analysis that we can do today, if you pull in the correct data set. Now, that includes wind direction, temperature, location information, everything brought in. They bet the performance of that individual that day, if you build everything in, uh, you can actually predict something quite remarkable. Um, based on what I've read of the case study after when we did, when we did I read the debrief, we built a model of what would be winner's journey would be like. So, we didn't predict who the journey was, but we predicted the journey. We, we didn't predict who the winner was, but the prediction was for what would the journey be like for that player. Reason being, I think, that golf pros, their performance variabilities are very small. You, you know, the winner is usually will win by one or two strokes. So it's very difficult for you to say exactly out of you know, 20 people in the top of the rank, which one is going to win that day, because they're all within such a small margin. But if you take that and use that as an average golfer, and then you look at the course, you can start predicting which hole they're going to birdie and which hole they're going to miss. So the prediction was interesting because it actually predicted, I think, which hole they actually did well in, the winner, and which hole they didn't do well in, and how they actually ended the day. So I thought that was really interesting. Because that's, in many ways, what we're trying to do in, with micro-segmentation, what we're trying to do with customer prediction. You don't know exactly the person, but you can predict that journey that they're going to take. 
So I want to bring that in as well because I think it's an interesting point when you when you can still make really strong prediction even if the people that you're predicting about is quite familiar or similar to each other. Um, now, I was talking about uh, generative AI. Right? So that's a big topic these days. Um, maybe I'll come back to this in a minute because I'll do this slide first. I want to give you guys a bit of a um, a bit of information about generative AI. Um, I, I know it's a very, a very technical background. Uh, how many people are familiar with generative AI today? A few. Um, how about foundation model? That idea. A couple of people. Okay. Just going to quickly explain what what those things mean. Uh, now, our, our CEO, Arvind Krishna, recently uh, was interviewing with the uh, Financial Times, I think, at T.com, and uh, he mentioned ChatGPT. Well, he was he was asked directly, "What's ChatGPT meant to IBM and to the, the industry as a whole?" And um, Arvind's response was quite interesting. And now. Paraphrasing, um, I think he mentioned that it's that ChatGPT was a great market marketing moment for AI as a, as a technology. And and when he elaborated, he said it is kind of like a Netscape moment for the AI technology, Netscape for the internet, and ChatGPT for AI. Right. Before Netscape, everyone thought, what's the internet? Right. Which is something that the geeks do in, you know, back in their, on their computers. Netscape made it something that everybody understood. And then the internet exploded from there. And I think the point is the same. ChatGPT showed the world what AI could actually be, and now it exploded from there. In fact, the explosion was amazing. Like nothing short of staggering what ChatGPT did. In five days, they acquired the first one million user. I have never seen it. Like, I mean, any company who can acquire first million users in five days is remarkable. Uh, I think face, uh, not Facebook, um, Instagram took two and a half months to do that. Um, in by two months, ChatGPT had a hundred million users. It took TikTok nine months to do that. So it's incredible how many people are actually looking at this. So it is a shifting moment. Right? So but what is it exactly? And I've seen it described in many ways. It's a really, really good piece of AI. It's a very, very sophisticated neural network model. Somewhere is over 100 billion parameters in that model. It is a massive, massive neural network model. And ChatGPT4 is even going to be bigger. It's one of the largest models out there at this time. The reason why it's so convincing in generating text is the size of that model. And I'll come back to that because it's a double-edged sword when it comes to a model that large and what that means to business. Because after this, I'm going to talk about how a foundation model is going to impact the business world. This is ChatGPT. I would say it's a consumer product. It is more for consumer to use, to play with, to generate interesting things to save them time. I, I mean, I've used it to write birthday cards. I'm terrible at writing birthday card messages. I said, can you write me a birthday card message for my niece? I write it all very nicely and, and everything. Uh, but am I ever going to ask it for banking or investment advice? Never going to do that because that's not what it's for. It's, it's not that is. It's not a knock against like the. The, the technology of ChatGPT, it's just not what it's designed to do. In fact, one uh, really interesting CEO of a different tech company, and maybe, maybe being a little bit cheeky, described it as, um, uh, what do you say, uh, auto completion on steroids. Because it, what it does is actually try to predict the next word that fits best. Now, that's one class of neural network model called large language models, and they all belong to something that Stanford University first coined and called it foundation models. What foundation models are is really, really big, usually neural network model, trained with huge amount of unlabeled data, massive amount, 
um, usually unsupervised or self-supervised learning. So it doesn't require a human to teach. It just sits there and churn on its own and look for pattern. And what that means is, of course, a lot of compute is required. Not a lot of human intervention, but a lot of compute, a lot of data is required. And once that model is trained, the difference between a foundation model and a traditional machine learning model is that it's not for just a single task. It's a general model that can be tweaked, can be fine-tuned for downstream tasks. You can create, you can use that model and perform a hundred different tasks with it as opposed to just one. And that's where the value comes in. The initial training is very expensive. The initial training data set is very hard to find. But once you have it, further application can benefit tremendously. Now, IBM has actually been doing research in this space for the last few years now. And what we found uh, with these type of models is that the initial training is expensive, lots of data required. But after that is done, usually you only need about a tenth to as low as the one one hundredth of the data to train the model to do specific tasks after that. So where it used to take, you know, each model take X uh, to, to build a specific model for each one, using a foundation model is 10% of X to do those same tasks. So in a way, you pay for a tax up front and you get benefit downstream later on. Makes it faster and also makes it tremendously more accurate. Now I mentioned this is one class of foundation models. There are a whole bunch of other ones, different neural network. Uh, you've seen other from OpenAI actually. DALI, for example, is the DALI 2 is the, the one that generates picture. You, you tell it's a multimodal AI actually. You tell it what you want it to draw, and it'll draw in the style of that uh, DALI or some other painters. So that's an image generation. Uh, typically, is a auto encoder of kind to build that. Um, there, there are many others. Now, we think that will change business. We absolutely do. We don't think business should be using ChatGPT out of the box at all right now, but there are other chat-based AI that they should do. So as a result of that, uh, IBM has decided that it's the right time for us to launch a new uh, set of products and to release foundation models for our, our customer to use. So uh, where did those foundation models come from? Lost control. foundation models come from? Well, we've had a running relationship with NASA for a while. In February, we actually re uh, released this press release, and no one really noticed it, but it's interesting because NASA and IBM has decided to team up to build a number of custom foundation models to help solve climate change as a problem. So what's, what we're doing with them is saying, well, okay, let's get together and work. Um, we're taking 300,000 uh, of their scientific, scientific literature, 300,000 different uh, review article, to build a large language model so that scientists doing research on climate change can have chats and find out what's going on. Um, we're going to build a satellite image and geospatial data set. That image data set will help scientists predict what the Earth will look like if something happens, if there was a flood, if there was a forest fire, if there was a uh, oil tanker leak, what would change? What would be changing in the landscape? So similar to what Dali two would do in terms of uh, uh, painting a picture, similar to what ChatGPT would do in terms of talking to you individually, it's, it's just talking about science. Now these projects have been ongoing in Boston and various research centers for a while. Many of those uh, foundation models coming in those projects is now being released as a product in some in uh, in something we call Watson X. So that's been announced just two days ago. Uh, it's a, so what we're trying to do is say, well, 
why don't we release a large language model that, for example, SCBX can take, add the own training that you need for the business unit, and then use that as a generative AI to answer questions for the customer. Now, how is that different from, let's say, ChatGPT? Well, the biggest difference about these foundation models is that all the data set used to train them is 100% curated and embedded. Our legal expert has taken a look at it, make sure that there's zero copyright violation in any way. We have ethicists looking at it to make sure that we are using ethical data. The source of the data is non-customer, that we have full permission to use that data for training. In addition to that, uh, we've done all the hate filters and all any question of com questionable content has been taken out. Now, smaller data set, but it's a data set that's unlikely to hallucinate. And hallucination is a problem with neural network, it definitely is. Um, in fact, the larger the model, the, the trickier it is, because like a human brain, you can hallucinate, and uh, it's, it's hard to figure out what part of the the neural network is doing that. And it is not possible to just remove. You, you basically, the neural network is trained in a way, you cannot just say, oh, it's like a human brain. You cannot just say, I'll cut a part of it off. You, you will no longer have that. So um, the, the way to prevent undesirable hallucination in AI is to make sure that you're clean about the data that goes in. It's really an important part. So what we've done is actually have these curated data and then using that curated data and started to build these models. The idea is that these models will not have flight of fantasy that go take you in the wrong places. It will be predictable. And when you train it to answer questions, for example, about banking customer service, it will stay true to the intent. Uh, they're much smaller. They're not as impressive as ChatGPT, don't get me wrong. They're much smaller than neural network models. But why is it good? Well, two reasons why it's good. One, um, it's easier to train these small models to customize for what you need it to be. The outcome is much more predictable. And when you run it, when you actually use it to answer questions, it's much cheaper than the electricity bills. Because if you use a large, large model every time you call it, your electricity bill is actually a lot higher. So the question that we are seeking to answer and we are hoping that the, in the, the industry or the, our, our customer agrees with, with us is that it's about fit for purpose. You know, I, I was watching the announcement the other day and, and the analogy that was used was ChatGPT can write you a resume or write an introduction for yourself or resume in Shakespearean English. In fact, the other day, uh, Tuesday, I was giving a talk in a marketing uh, 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 event, and I asked ChatGPT to write me a ad for IBM in the voice of Don Draper from Mad Men. And they can do that. It actually wrote me a paragraph. Anyone watch, ever watch Mad Men? Really good show, AMC, right? Uh, it can do that. It can write me a, a whole paragraph in the voice of Mad, uh, Don Draper and so on. It can do all those things. But the question, and, and I think the, the example that was really poignant is that, but is that what we need if we're gonna build a chat interface for like a, a client-facing chat interface for a bank or for an insurance company? Do we really need it to speak Shakespearean English? Do we really need it to be able to do things in Don Draper's voice? And I, I think the answer is resounding, no, we actually don't need it. So why have such a large network? It's a lot of fun to use it for com uh, um, consumer use cases, but if every bank wants to run their own version of foundation model to do the work that they do, last thing you want is something that consumes extra resources to do things that you're never going to call upon for it to do. So that's why uh, models are much smaller, they're much more efficient, and they're much easier to train downstream to do what you need it to do. And the idea is really to deliver the you know, trusted AI for our customer that they can use to solve their own business problem. And we do this uh, by allowing you to add your own trusted data. The secret source of sources is your trusted data, right? And it's allow, will allow that to run anywhere 
and send your cloud. It doesn't matter where that data resides. And the final thing is we're never going to take your data and the learning back into our fold. We want to keep the model itself uh, with the vetted data set. It's called blue pile. It's a big pile of IBM data sitting in, a, in one of the largest uh, enterprise data commercial repository. So we use that to do training, but we're not going to take customer data and actually train our further train our model because that's yours to keep. So, um, you, and again, this, it goes both ways. You don't have to worry about the models being contaminated with other people's data either. Right? And you can train that models behind your own firewall. So that's uh, this thing called what's next. Now, I've also listed a bunch of different things here in terms of foundation models and what we, it can do. We have built foundation models in all these, in all these areas with industries in partnership. Um, we, I was in Boston um, February this year for the first time to visit uh, our MIT Watson lab. And a ton of the foundation model work happens to be being worked on there. And these models are actually built with a, uh, like a diamond uh, industry partner that are there. They, this is a, these models are built to solve problem that they want. And what we can do is harness those foundation models to help other customer do other things. So chemistry and materials, I've seen a foundation models that will generate um, possible molecules for pharmaceutical company to make new drugs. Moderna is actually a, a customer working with us um, to build foundation models. Because they want to use foundation model to build fa vaccine faster. Um, we have a company that's working with us to build better concrete so that they can have, concrete actually has a, a quite a high greenhouse em emission in its manufacturing. So by changing the formulation of concrete, you can actually significantly reduce the carbon footprint that your organization has. So that those are some of the problems that you can solve. Um, there's one that's, that's uh, on protein, creating new protein that may be able to deliver uh, therapy for cancer. For, for example, those are some of the, the use cases that's being built. Uh, geospatial, I mentioned the one that NASA is doing, so flood prediction. Geospatial, uh, I was just talking before about flood prediction because um, I think that's something really interesting for any, uh, for, for example, for SVX, uh, to potentially use something like that to reach out and to help farming communities. If you can use geospatial information to predict climate, to predict rainfalls, to predict impact of rainfall, flooding, you certainly can use that information to, re to reach out and help farming communities in Thailand, for example. So, um, and part of the reason I'm bringing this up with this group is, it, an, as I was talking to the CFO, is because I, uh, part of the reason I'm here is to get me thinking about well, what other problems can you solve with AI, not just necessarily the immediate stuff that you're working on, but also new business model. Can we apply that to some kind of microloan for farmers? Can we, what, what, what can be done uh, with that type of information? Um, from the IT side, actually that is one of the foundation model first wave that we'll release with Watson X. It will be a code generator. It will write Ansible code for you. So Ansible, Ansible playbook. You tell it what you want, it will write a playbook for you. So, uh, for IT operations, when you want to do IT automation, now a uh, IT a site resilient uh, engineer can sit back and actually do planning work and, and more uh, deeper uh, problem resolution work rather than spending time uh, writing scripts. You just tell the, the AI, I want the script, and the script will get written by itself. So one of the first things we're going to do there. Uh, image, dialogue, natural language, IT data set and so forth. All those will be coming out there. In what's the next there will be seven categories of foundation models being released. I think we're releasing 20 proprietary models, that's our current plan, that can be then uh, adopted to do different things across the entire uh, uh, operations of any business. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can use you know, chatbot, obviously, but you can also do other things with it. The other aspect, I think, that that I think is really interesting is we've also partnered up with a uh, with Hugging Face. Now, Hugging Face is a giant repository. Uh, it's like an open source foundation for AI models. So we have 
uh, uh, enter into an agreement to be the premier uh, enterprise support provider for hugging face model. So some of those models will find its way into the product itself as well to enhance that. And the other thing that we we're committed to do is that we are going to open source most of our foundation models as well. I don't think all of them, but most of them will also be contributed to the open source community. So nothing is locked in in this case. Now, what is what's an X? It's, it's a platform uh, to innovate, to build models on. So I won't get all you guys with the, a lot of details. Uh, effectively, it's a collaboration environment where people can come together and work on models, work on your models of, of your own, extend foundation models that, that we provided or have you face provided, and then uh, try to solve some actual business problems. Um, so that's the first bit. Like, what's the next about putting AI to work and allowing industry who may be an industry uh, user who is currently may still be using machine learning in the traditional sense to reach into and accelerate their journey to foundation model so that we can solve that new sense of problems. Um, any, but we, we could, with foundation model, I feel like I, I don't know if I need to explain what it can do for us. Foundation models basically generate things. Like you've got traditional models which are predictors. We predict things like, you know, is, is this customer going to churn? Is this credit card loan going to be repaid? That's the more classical machine learning model. And then you have predictive neural network, which try to predict what it is that it's seeing. So the perception is, it's like, here's a picture of a dog, here's a picture of a cat. And is it a, is predict that, yeah, this is likely a picture of a dog. And that's kind of the traditional convolutional net, uh, network. The, Generative AI, which is a, a subcategory of deep learning, is about generating new content. So in this case, instead of saying, oh, this is a picture of a dog, you can say, what if a cocker spaniel and a pulo had a baby? What would that dog look like? And it would generate that picture, even though it's never seen it before. That's the easy way to describe what they do, right? They do different things. They're all powerful but they do different things. So they don't replace each other. The, the idea here is that by introducing this to the other things that you're doing, can you build more compelling experience, more compelling products, more compelling user experience so that you can help your, your fellow employees, your customers, and so on. And that's kind of where the imagination needs to happen. Um, I will quickly introduce, there are three components to Watsonate. Watsonate AI is the foundation model and the AI platform. That's where uh, you can build your own machine learning model as well as your generative AI. That's where it will be run, that way, that's where you can share those models. But more importantly, it will also be monitored there. One of the things that we really believe in when it comes to AI usage, and I think this is gonna come across even more now. I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard some of the backlashes with ChatGPT, right? There were a lot of people that kind of got very excited in two months, and in the following two months, a lot of people got very upset with ChatGPT, including you know Elon Musk calling for not having any more powerful uh, AI than ChatGPT for at least six months. Uh, I think. Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, went as far as saying that he regretted the, his life work, the work that he has done, because he thinks that it can be quite dangerous. And I happen to, to think that, well, there's actually some truth to that. It can be very dangerous if we abuse this type of technology. It is very powerful. Uh, the fear was fake news, right? There's always that element. Hallucination telling people the wrong thing. But worse yet, what if a bad actor, someone who deliberately used this type of generative AI to do bad things? In fact, I think the example we used was a lot of people can go out there and, and spread all kinds of terrible news on the internet and you wouldn't be able to tell the truth. So, but the, the, but the, the reality is that, and, and he, he said he comforts himself in thinking that if he didn't do it, someone else would have. 
And, and I do believe that's true. The technology is the technology. I think it's the use case that we need to be careful of. And that's why inside WhatsAppX.ai, the, the uh, AI part of the product set, there's a significant amount of attention paid to trust and fairness and transparency and bias detection. So just to make sure that we can honestly look at the solution that we create and know that we haven't done something that potentially, or at least we haven't missed any uh, ethical consideration when using AI. So that's why there's a, a lot of that built into uh, the Watson X but AI product set, a lot of uh, trusted capabilities. Second component, Watson X got data. Now this is an interesting one because um, it's actually a data platform. Uh, what we used to call this a lake house when the during the research stage. And the lake house uh, concept is kind of the evolution to the data lake. It's actually taking it to a new angle. Uh, there's a lot of new technology being put into it. I think we, at one point or another, got very excited with Hadoop. And everyone went out and built Hadoop data lake. And then we realized that one giant Hadoop data lake really didn't fit. It, it was meant to be the things that solve all problems. And I think, you know, IBM kind of, everyone was behind that for a little bit. But I think it turns out that it's the one thing that only solved a little bit of everything, but didn't really do anything particularly well. And that's why Spark then eventually came along and other things. Um, in what's the next dot data, there's a, a new capabilities incoming that will, one, reduce the amount of data movement. So we're trying to reduce data movement and reduce data duplication. Uh, we have designed a data platform that has separated compute and storage into two separate layers. You can now store data, single copy, and access data in multiple ways. SQL, Spark, and you fit for purpose engine. Um, main reason that we've been doing that is because when we're experimenting with AI, one, we need a lot of data. Two, that data in today's enterprise can live anywhere. It could be on, on any cloud. Um, ETL is tremendously expensive and not really that practical. And to be honest, I think uh, you know, I think SVX and the, and the data X team or the tech X team will know data center cost is actually not cheap. Copying data is actually a very expensive proposition. So one of the things we did with uh, with what's the next dot data is to make sure that a single copy of data stored on object storage can be accessed by multiple sets of compute. So you can have a SQL engine reading that data set, use it. In fact, you can spin up as many SQL engine as you like, so that if you have multiple projects that needs the same data set, you're only using more compute, you're not using more storage. You can have Spark for uh, machine learning, you can have Presto for SQL engine, and that's kind of the idea that we've built into it. And we just released that um, two days ago. Finally, what's next? But governance. That's an end-to-end -end governance piece that I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about. How what time do I have in time? I want to time check. Ten more minutes? Okay. I will try to be fast. Ten more minutes. I'll, I want to get onto a couple of other examples of what we have done with, with some of this stuff. What's next up? Governance. Um, provide data and AI governance end-to-end. -end. And the idea is to put a platform together where a team of technical specialists, line of business users, compliance officers, CISO, CDO, can have access to data and can have access to AI and share information uh, with each other. I think it's one of those things that's particularly interesting given SVX uh, subsidiary structures. So how do you share data among the various different entity companies safely without ever compromising uh, data privacy? So the notion has always been that um, we work by centering around a catalog. The catalog is where everyone can publish what they want to share with each other. So these are data set and in, some, in the latest generation, 
these could be also AI models, machine learning models. Let's say I build a fraud detection model. I could actually put it here and publish it. Now, what this tool will actually do is when I publish the model, it will say, well, let me automatically scan the model, the Python code, for example, extract information about this model. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Any information that it can extract, it will extract it and put it in the catalog so you can, walk, you can look at it. Anyone who wants to use it. It does have the data as well. If you want to publish a database to share, you can say, I want this database to be, or this set of tables to be available to my fellow, to my uh, colleagues to look at. Again, the tool will automatically go in, scans every table, it column, sample it, give it a quality score, actually, to say how good are that data set. And even, and the, the more important part in this solution is the fact that it classifies the, the, the individual columns into business terms. And any associated PII requirement will also be automatically applied. And that's, I think, one of the more interesting and powerful concepts. So when I want to share data, let's say I want to share, share a data mark with another business unit. In there, there might be customer ID or, or customer name, phone number, uh, email addresses. Things that I would be under PII regula regulatory requirement not to share, let's say, across business unit. What the tools will automatically do is it will detect them, regardless of where they are. And you can create a rule that says all emails should be masked for anyone outside the business unit. And you create that rules in the catalog itself. When you go and access the data through the actual uh, What's an X platform, it will actually block anything. It will redact all email addresses, it will redact all name, anything that you have a rules, it will, it will actually redact and cover. It means that you can share, maybe the customer ID you can share because you want to be able to use the same customer ID across, dif across different business units to, to create a, a customer 360 use. But any of the information that should be protected, credit card number, email address, it will be automatically redacted or masked and you don't actually have to do any work. The other aspect is when you're using this platform to do innovation, experiment work, as a data scientist, you can come in. I can get data from two different business units, build a comparison models for, you know, for uh, maybe do a, a dimensionality reduction model to say, do I have people on one business unit, are they likely to buy things from my other business unit, for just as, as a high level example. I can do that knowing that I have the safety of the rules protection. I will not be able to see the credit card information or anything sensitive, but I will be able to see purchase histories and other things, so I can actually build that machine learning model. Um, I think it's a, it's a really useful feature, especially for organizations that have data set that has to be protected. Now, this is all done when the data is in being cataloged. You don't actually have to do any manual work. And if you change the rules, let's say you want it to be more stringent, you want to restrict it even more, it will be automatically applied dynamically. And all the data being masked is being masked in, when it's in transport. It doesn't duplicate, it doesn't copy, it doesn't overwrite the original data set. So the original data inside your business unit stays the same, but when someone goes and see it, it's all protected. The latest um, capabilities here is we've also added, so, so this is great if you access the data on the platform, right? If I'm doing data science experiment, good. Data scientists can do their work, we can innovate, we can do everything. That's all done. But what if, but what's not protected is if someone connected to the database directly. So that, that's the kind of the upstream use cases. Um, so in the most recent uh, sets of uh, update and in capabilities, uh, we've also integrated that catalog with a product we call Guardian. Uh, Guardian is a database activity monitoring solution. There's a little agent that sits at the database level. It could be an Oracle database, it could be a DB2 database, it, it doesn't matter. And it will monitor incoming SQL access. The most recent integration will take the PII rules that you put in the catalog and automatically apply it to every database protected by Guardian. 
regardless of how we access. If you directly connect it to, to it using JDBC, it will still can be offering the same protection. Uh, that's, an, that's a piece of technology that's being added because of compliance issue. But, um, I know there was one request previously uh, on, on a conversation coming, preparing for this, is to talk about measuring the impact of AI. I want to touch on that before maybe we'll just have an open discussion for a little while. Um, I mentioned before that this platform will also help you monitor AI for its performance. So when you deploy machine learning model on the platform, you can say, I want you to help detect any biases for gender, for age, for you know, the areas of the, of the country they live in, right? Are there any biases? You can set those biases up, and if uh, a bias that, that's a very reach a certain threshold, you will be notified. It will tell you, hey, this is problem, uh, this model has a problem. If the performance of the model start to drift, it start stop being accurate, it will detect that, it will also notify you. So anything that you deploy here will be fully monitored and you can see, you will get a notification if something starts to go bad. The other thing it will do is it will auto, do auto retrain if it's necessary. It start off doing automatically retraining so that it gets the accuracy back up to that same level. So I think it's quite desirable when you start rolling out a lot of AI. The one thing in there that is interesting as well is that when you use the model on the platform, um, each time you call it, it will generate a, an identifier that this model is being used and it's being sent back to the calling applications. So what that is meant for is for transparency and audit. Every decision of a model made on this, if you want it to, can be audited. What that means is in the future, you can come back with that idea and say, hey, this credit card um, approval automation was incorrect, let's say. Tell me why that decision was made. You send that number back into the system, it will come back with what were the input at that point in time, what was the model used, what was the predictive element, whatever value it happens to be, what, you know, it will tell you which of the attribute was the contributing factors for that credit card approval to be, to, to be approved. Now, that was meant for regulatory transparency, so a lot of bank client, a lot of insurance company needs that because in the future, you know, if you deny a medical claim that there could be legal consequences, it's built that to be uh, used for that. But if you want to start measuring how those decisions impact the bottom line of the bank further on, it is possible to use that to link back to which model and which project did drive that decision. If you store that, let's say, in the application that you built using it for. So there's a way to link back AI decision to business outcome. It's not meant to do that, but I was actually seeing a way for us to measure, you know, we invested these money building these models. You see a way to go back and measure how that impacted the actual bottom line of the, of the bank's business. I think there's a way to, for a little bit of custom coding to kind of link back in terms of how well, like, did that model make us money or did that model lose us money? So I think there's a way to, to build that into, into the solution here. Uh, what's, what's meant for but when I was asking, what, what can we do there? Well, we can probably do that in, in that space. Um, I know I'm out of time basically, so one of the things I'll mention is that IBM actually ha use our own technology. We, we like to be, uh, we, we keep now call ourselves customer zero. We want to be the first client to a lot of these things. Um, there was a, a slide that I can put up, but um, we, we've basically started using our own data solution to start uh, understanding our own customer base. So we, we've got this uh, giant data platform that has, a, a, I think, 20 million customer contact that has to be resolved because all the companies that we work with, so we actually build a picture, for example, using uh, the data governance capabilities and some, uh, some customer 360 capabilities, we actually have, in the last couple of years, we built our uh, internal uh, infrastructure and data platform, if you will, so that I, I can now, with 
within one second, within less than a second time, resolve to basically any customer entity that I want to contact and find the right contact information of the right person using a single API call. So that's some of the other thing, maybe less sexy that we're doing with it, but you, you take this data platform, there are so many different capabilities on it. One of the things we're doing is to resolve customer client 360. And uh, I think today we probably, that, that particular API now today gets between 30 to 40,000 calls every day. Because you know, when we reach a, reach out to a customer, we want to make sure we reach out to the right people. Uh, if you want to hear more about how that is implemented, I can come back and you know, we can have a call um, and, and perhaps take a look at that. Because I think that is really pertinent for, when, again, when you have multiple company trying to touch the same population and customer base, building that, we call it a client 360, this one solution, this one API, the other API is called contact 360. So client 360 helps us understand which company is which. Contact 360 is an API that we use when we want to find someone to call on in that. So you know, if I need to make a phone call to SCP, I would call contact 360 and it will find the people that I want to talk to. So those are the two API that we built. Uh, if you guys are interested in that, I can, I can actually come back and talk a little bit more about that. And, uh, questions, comment, brainstorming, happy to do any of that. Uh, yeah. I think, um, Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the customer 360 project, I think it's something that we want to do. As you said, we have many companies. DataX is actually the one who will be uh, making this happen. Yeah. I think maybe as a point of closure, you can share the journey. Absolutely. Of the Absolutely. This time with your contract uh, position. Yeah, so who will be the team that can make this happen? Yeah, I, I can even send a couple of slides in terms of. Uh, there's a couple of infographics live. We have something called, you know, one of the APIs is Client 360, the other one is the Contact 360. So uh, I, it's, it's really interesting because it's not just an analytic exercise, but it's an operational capability. So in the past, you would do MDM and they become a database and, and whatnot. But I think the powerful part is if you can make it a real time API that's because I don't need all you know, 20 million contacts. What I need is the one. It's finding the one that's interesting. And I think for application within a CDX group, that's the, the piece that's going to be more, most interesting to have DataX come up with you know, a client 360 API, contact 360 API, that kind of thing is, is going to be uh, quite useful. Yeah, happy to share more information on that space. So you say that um, this Watson X is an alternative to ChatGPT. So let's say if we at XCX would like to have a foundation model, yeah. what should be the consideration whether we choose ChatGPT or Watson X? So I will I will follow uh, head of research uh, Dario Gill actually simply pointed out one thing very simple. ChatGPT, as cool as it is, is a, con is, is a consumer product. It's, it's not ready for business use. It's not designed for business use. It's very big, so it takes a lot to run it. But also, it's built with just content from the internet. And as a result, it's prone to hallucinate. Depending on who you ask, actually, um, the data NAMI, I read an article very recently, said 15 to 20 percent hallucinations. Now, hallucination in AI, and some of you know it, some of you may not, it it's, means that when an AI is convinced of a fact that is completely incorrect, but it forcefully says that's what it is. And it tends to do that because it has some questionable content in the trained data set. So what we what these foundation models are supposed to be is that you, our customer will know exactly what we use to train this model. And that they can, we can assure you that the data used to train it is completely, you know, there's zero hate messaging in it. There's definitely no biases introduced. There's no gender issues. Like all that is completely clean. And that's why we think it's 
as a business perspective, this is actually the way to go. It's cheaper to run, it's safer to run, and you add your own data to it to make it an SCB personality, so it will know the SCB information, but it will be, uh, let's say, a, a, a chatbot that you can trust not to say something silly to your customer. So definitely, it, it, I, I wouldn't even say it's an alternative, I would simply say that don't, don't use ChatGPT for, 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 yeah, because that would cause some problems, yeah. So um, some of the so, so the, some of the NLP uh, capability it, it works out of the box. You you give it facts, you give it some text, and you say, okay, summarize this for me. It will actually write a summary for you already out of the box. So language understanding is already there. You can further tune it, but it, it does come out of the box knowing how to, for example, summarize text. Which is, in a way, what ChatGPT does, right? It has a lot of content, it writes a single paragraph. Um, in fact, we, we can already use it to pair up with, let's say I go into a repository of many different uh, text document regulations, let's say, and I want to summarize the overall position on, on data privacy. It will have many, many paragraphs. But what it, what it can already do is take these paragraphs and then just write a single one. So that it's a single fluent thing that you can read uh, and, and help you be more productive. So, so it works out of the box. Um, the next step is to kind of train it further to customize it for what you need it to. And, and, and the API is broken down as well into summarization, understanding, so that it's faster. Like, you, you can train one part to understand a customer's language, for example. Um, like, you might be like, uh, uh, any real, real language, like how, how long does it take to engage? Um, we, we actually do. We have actually a number of engagement that has been done in the past with our consulting team. Um, Based on the announcement that was made, we are going to actually add additional resources in the consulting team to help client ad adopt the technology. Um, but this is not, like, if you look at the speed that we need to move, uh, we're really look, talking about maybe three months project. We're not talking about years. We, we're really talking about getting it up and running, starting the training and modification, and moving forward with it. Anything else? Yeah, for the explainable AI workflow here, the explainable is mean like the input and output correlation or what to, to, to explain like why the model. So it depends on, it's really a question actually, that um, it, it depends on the type of models that mm -hmm. we're talking about. If it's a um, traditional machine learning model, you can actually explain it down to these are the input parameters that drove the decision. For example, um, in many binary tree decisions, there are weight factors on you know, income, credit card rating, what, whatnot. You can actually get down to that level, so it does explain input and output. Now, the, the question did come up when we talk about what's an ex-foundation model. The foundation model, the challenge is, is that um, you can't really explain why a neural network does what it does. It, it's, you know, anyone who say otherwise, I think our, our research, head of research says, anyone who tells you they can explain what a neural network does, it's not being entirely truthful. You, you just can't, it's just way too big when you have over you know, a million or a billion parameters. But what you can do is explain where, with the data that you use to train it, where did it come from, the algorithm that you use, which type of algorithm is it? Where was it used? Like these are the things that you can you can exp you can explain and trace. So that, that's why I said it varies and depends on the type of model. So the, I think the best we can do when it comes to neural network is understanding the provenance of where the model came from, who wrote it, what was the, the data used to train, and so on. That's the best we can do from that side. 
So the output of the system is going to be like linkage back to the data source or what? It's that kind of thing. I, I mean like the relationship of output and the data we, we, we train. For, for example, unsupervised right. learning that yeah. things. Yeah. So these can show us back to the data source and data point that impact yeah. the output yeah. or what? So there's two aspects to it. One is there's a model risk management workflow that comes on the platform, which is a template that uh, some of our customers really like because what it does is it starts off with why are you building a model in the first place? So there's a business objective there. Then it says, okay, given this business objective, what are you trying to achieve? So it documents the requirement of the, the, the models before you even start. And that's kind of this risk management workflow piece. So in large scale, kind of a factory-like production, what you want to do is actually understand each one of those. Out of that workflow, we'll, be, we'll generate uh, fact sheets. So data fact sheets and things that, that you need to know about the model that you're building. Where did the data come from? Who's the developers? Who approved it for use? Version one, two, three, and four, and so forth. All that is tracked in the system. That fact sheet's also linked to Git repository. So when you start rolling out the data to downstream use cases, right? Um, it, what you what we'll be able to do is not actually start publishing the version and keep track of all of that. When it's in uh, production and running, we also track the invocation of that model and what uh, decision it made each time. And, and again, it's optional. You don't have to do it because that store all the data. Uh, and then you can then close loop if you want downstream. But the close loop, of course, require the, the application developer to keep the the, uh, the unique ID. Right, because if that's thrown away, then the, you, you can't close the loop. So that's where I think the impact measurement comes in. If you want to do the impact measurement, you, you need to, to make sure that you close the loop and bring, bring that back into the, the flow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Captain Kidman.